It's the first day of the second semester of the school year at Liangyuan International High School. The air is full of excitement, anticipation, and a little bit of nervousness. The faces of the students show endless possibilities and limitless potential. High school is a special time in life. These are the prime formative years that can decide the success and failure for one's future. These are years that, once passed, will never come back again. For some of these students, these few months will be their last in China, as they'll be studying and living in another country next year. Their days are full of uncertainty, but also hope. What are students? When we think of students, we often imagine a faceless, voiceless mass of people. We think of students as a homogenous group. If education were a product, students would be the consumers. As any good business person can tell you, ignoring the needs and wants of the consumer is a crazy way to do business, and it's also destined to fail. Unfortunately, this is too often what happens in education. Education is one of those few special fields where industry decides what product consumers receive. Students are thought of as unlabeled receptacles, just waiting to be filled with knowledge. Standard curriculums tell teachers what they must teach, and also decide what students must learn. Rigid testing decides what is considered failure and what is considered success. It often seems that the goal of education is simply to move students to the next level of education. Too often we forget that students are people. They're individuals with goals and dreams that belong to only themselves. This one-size-fits-all model of education that we see today. Satisfies the wants of very few, and no one really receives what they truly need. Isn't it time to focus on the consumer, to focus on the student? Isn't it better to provide education that helps students achieve their goals instead of telling them what their goals should be? No one can make it, and I take the traditional. Chinese food. Okay. I want to learn how to make it. Then uh, I also will take a document, make a documentary about the finding Chinese traditional food. Then I will want to open a restaurant and sell those traditional Chinese food, like a uh, cafeteria, cafe. No, actually, I want to be a vlogger, but I think I cannot. <laughs> I did find someone I want to uh, to be my cooperation. Maybe you can uh, you can read you can join the major about the camera about the documentary. Yeah. And you will, no, you will be easier. My, uh, Maybe other foreigners will help you because they also will be interested in Chinese. I, I want to take pictures. The most thing I want to do is open a restaurant. That's okay. I think. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Good at cooking, you know what? Uh, the time uh, yeah. I I I lived in Hong Kong. Yeah. He cooked a lot of food. I hope in the future I can become more confident and capable. I hope I can. Uh, go to the top university in Canada, 
in the future. Well, I think that still depends on me. Yeah, I should be more hardworking, yes. Also, um, I hope um, while after I go to the foreign country, I can still uh, have a re reunion with my family sometimes. Because I think it's, it's going to be really hard for me if I am alone in the foreign, foreign country and study. So. Um, and the last thing that I hope is to uh, graduate from Liao Yuan successfully because it's going to it's going to happen soon. According to the Project Atlas website. China sent more than 270,000 students to America in the 2013-2014 school year, accounting for 31% of the total. That means that almost one in every three international students in America comes from China. When we look at information from the Canadian Bureau for International Education, we get the same picture. China is the country that sends the most international students to Canada, more than 95,000 in the year of 2013. That's 32.42% of the total international student population. China sends almost one in every three students. Australia is another attractive destination for the world's international students. Looking at the numbers, we see that China, once again, is in the number one spot sending 29.3% of all international students to Australia in the year of 2012. When we look at data from the UK Council for International Student Affairs, we can see once again that the top sending country is China, with more than 87,000 students in the 2013 and 2014 school year. All these numbers have led to charts like this one, which shows the total number of international students sent by each country in the world. The orange line is, of course, China. Most people think that this means going abroad is getting easier and easier. But in actuality, this chart shows you exactly the opposite. With greater numbers of Chinese students going abroad, also comes greater competition. Also, these last few years of increased Chinese students in the world has allowed Western schools to get a better understanding of Chinese students, both the good and the bad. Clearly, thousands of Chinese students have dreams of going to the West for education, but very few have stopped to think about how Western schools view Chinese pupils. Here's an article from the New York Times. It's titled, Inside a Chinese Test Prep Factory. The word they used was factory. A factory is hardly a place that you would think of when you think of an institution that creates well-rounded, inquisitive, and successful students. The article describes Chinese students as the world's most scarily proficient test takers. It's clear that when schools in the West think of Chinese students, they think of students that do well on tests. However, when interviewing a retired Chinese chemistry teacher, he had this to say. They know how to take a test, but they can't think for themselves. It would seem that traditional Asian rote memorization techniques are not benefiting the image of Chinese students who wish to go to school in the West. This Time Magazine article, which is titled Forged Transcripts and Fake Essays, explains that many Chinese students are not familiar with the process of applying to Western universities. They often turn to education agents for help. These education agents often promise to send these students to the schools of their dreams. This article describes the agents as unscrupulous and explains that because of such high competition among these education companies, cheating is often widespread. This CNN news story, titled Chinese Students Found Cheating to Get into U.S. Colleges, mentions an excerpt that is funny, sad, and infuriating at the same time. In this article, 
An admissions officer recounts the time she read a very surprising personal essay from China. In the essay, it was written, "I did this, I did that." Insert girl's name here. Needless to say, this particular student was not offered an acceptance letter. The Chronicle of Higher Education had this to say in an article titled "The China Conundrum." The article cited numbers which concluded ninety percent of Chinese applicants submit false recommendations. It was also mentioned that many college application essays were not written by the students themselves. Finally, it was said that half of all high school transcripts were false. The article described Chinese students as believing that the goal of learning was to pass a test. It draws serious doubt on the ability of Chinese students to acquire knowledge for future use. A follow-up article in the Chronicle came from the perspective of a Chinese international student already studying in the West. He said that many of his Chinese classmates had trouble communicating in English, and because of this, they were poorly prepared for life in the United States. He also said that many Chinese international students will avoid talking to non-Chinese speakers. He also said this about exams. You can succeed in exams without knowing what you're doing at all. This would point out the fact that exam scores may not be the best indicator of a student's potential for future success. This article from the University World News tells much of the same story. Commonly mentioned issues such as plagiarism of personal essays, intensive coaching for entrance interviews. And other questionable practices are stated to be common in China. Again, another factor that is mentioned is that the English competency of Chinese students often presents significant problems. Further damaging the image of Chinese international students is this recent piece of news featured in the Wall Street Journal. The story tells of a situation where Chinese citizens conspired to take college entrance exams on behalf of others. Or paid for others to do it for them. What Chinese students may not understand is that in Western schools, academic honesty is taken very, very seriously. It's difficult to say how accurate these numbers and data are, or how much truth these reports hold. But the fact is that, unfortunately for Chinese students, many Western schools view them in a negative light. An incredible number of Chinese students hope to go to school in the West. The high demand for Western education has led to an explosion in the number of local international schools in China in the last decade. These schools are also called bilingual schools. It's almost as if sending children to an international school has become something that is considered fashionable, like a fad that people are following these days. The belief is that attending an international school will better prepare the students to enter and do well in a Western educational setting. Unfortunately, few people, including parents and students themselves, have really thought clearly about the reasons why they want to join an international school. Many attend for the wrong reasons. So, why do you want to go to an international school? Mm, because、uh, I, I like、uh, I think Canada, Canada, is a beautiful country, so I want to go to Canada International School. If I study here, I can enjoy the life. Because、uh, my my math、uh, Chinese uh, and so on smart. Two months mark、uh, is isn't、um, too good. I think uh, um I think、uh, go board will give me a good chance to study. I can't um in in China the students are very. Great, and、um, I think I can't 
do the best and um, I will feel filled. I will feel. And so I want to go abroad. Um, because my too many classmates tell me that's too fun and my classmates classmates as very kind it may be a lot of fun but um, are you sure it will help your future mm, my future work and because my father and my mother think I need to go to um, other country in the China work do you want to work hard work good as uh, um, because China's people is very many you it's hardly to work a good job do you want to go to another country yes why because um, I don't know, I, I need to say what, but I wanted to go to International University. P please explain why. Why do you want to go to another country? Mm, because, I don't know, say what, uh, because uh, I don't like uh, Chinese public school teachers are only look your uh, exam result and I don't like that so I want to go to international school. After speaking with a large number of Chinese students about their ideas on this issue, we get the feeling that many of them are attending international schools for all the wrong reasons. Often mentioned reasons were that the students don't do well in their current school, or they feel that the Chinese education system is too competitive. What they may not have thought about, however, is that people from all over the world go to the West to study. Among these are many of the best and the brightest. If anything, studying abroad would be even more competitive. Some students said that studying abroad would allow them to visit beautiful places and to enjoy their life. While having fun is certainly important, it hardly seems like a very good reason for a student to change their lives and to enter a totally new social and educational system. A large number of students said that they're going abroad because their parents want them to. The students themselves have no idea what studying abroad would be like, or what the reasons are to do so. Another popular response from the students stated that they don't like having so much homework, meaning that their current Chinese schools assign very much of it. What they may not realize is that Western schools also assign a wide variety of tasks, reading, and projects for their students to do. When analyzing the reasons for why Chinese students want to study abroad, it becomes painfully obvious that many are doing so for the wrong reasons. Many students have chosen to go abroad not because it is a goal that they have or a pursuit that they hope to accomplish, but simply because they are running away from something else. How can one hope to succeed in such a large task, such as studying abroad, unless one is 100% committed to the cause. Because 
一个目的的家长比较多，而不是说他真的想真的想在国外学习，或者真的想去哪里留学。我我们接触的这部分家长可能是这样。Talking with a number of young students, it seems clear that many of them have no reason for going abroad. It's almost as if they feel going abroad will automatically make everything better. Perhaps we should start with a more general, but even more important question: What's the reason that people go to school? Why do people go to school?、Mm. Um, to wait, wait, wait. Study. Maybe people go to school because that's what everyone does, but that's not a very good answer. It's important to ask yourself these questions because nobody else will do it for you. What do you want from your education? What are you trying to achieve by going to school? It's important to remember that in any undertaking in life, success depends on a large number of small but interconnected steps. The first step towards success is to have a clear goal and an understanding of the reasons that you're taking a certain path. Mr. David Chang is senior vice president and head of the China desk for Latin America at one of the largest international banks in the world. He talked with us regarding his thoughts about an increasingly international society and what it takes to be competitive in the contemporary workplace. You 静下心来，跟自己对话。我认为不需要去问太多别人的意见，父母的意见听一听，参考一下。但在你们现在的年龄，我相信听进去的几率也不太大。那最终所有的决定会取决于你自己，所以你必须跟自己的心对话。如果今天你觉得我的目标很明确，那已经明确到我非完成它不可，这就是我现阶段最好的 solution。那就去啊 ，Why not？ 因为在你的内心当中，你已经觉得这件事情现在是 top priority。我觉得，其实教育的本身来讲，一方面是知识的一个传授，可能更重要的是教给他一个，就是让他能够知道如何去探索这个世界，以后能够自己有这个学习的一个本领，或者说认知社会的一个本领，这个是最重要的。嗯，你也同意说啊？是的，我是这么认为。教育，因为学校也是个整体嘛，除了那个教授知识以外，他应该还会学到一些独立性啊。包括呃和那个同学之间的相互沟通啊，呃，包括他应该会具备的一些呃基本的道德啊，包括和同学呃老师之间的一些那种团队的协作啊，我觉得这些应该也是会。那么我觉得做卷子本身不是目的，但是我觉得也是一种有效的方式，是去掌握知识，但是这不是教育的一个本质的一个目的。本质的目的，其实我觉得还是要教会他一种学习的本领。就像我们说“授之以鱼，不知授不如授之以渔”，一定要有这种你探索这个世界，要学会方法，这个比你获取知识是更重要。呃，我觉得其实最主要的说的现实一点的，其实在我们目前的社会，我觉得最主要的一点，以我作为家长来讲，我希望他以后能够成为一个自食其力、独立的一个人，能够不去，就是说能够在，就是说不依靠父母或者
，你没有努力过，那你肯定是不会有一个好的结果，对吧？只要是你努力了，你觉得这个结果，呃，是无愧于你这个结果的过那个，呃，最终的一个一个出来的一个结果的，我觉得这就可以了。可能我们中国目前的教育还是对于知识的一个掌握或者说记忆是更侧重的。就是、说我们强调的是这方面，但是对于探索或者说是怎么样思维、逻辑思维这方面是会差一些。那么可能跟国外的这种教育相比，可能是有比较大的一个教育方式的一个差别。呃，但是怎么说呢？也许各有利弊。中国学生的基础知识一直都是很好的，所以说也也就是说近几年我也听说，不是上海有这个就是那个什么披萨考试，不是中国的中学生一直在在世界都是领先的吗？所以就说我们的基础教育是不错的，呃，我相信虽然说我们的其他方面的一些运用的一些能力，也许跟国外是有差别，但是我觉得基础知识的牢固其实跟其他的方面并不是完全冲突的。那么如果有适当的机会，或者说有如果有适当的方法，能够把这些结合起来，那么我觉得中国学生其实是可以做到。是希望，我觉得中国的孩子，包括中国的教育，我自己的孩子也是，我觉得他们可能一个就是缺少一个解决问题的一个能力啊，就是这是一个，还有一个是觉得，呃，缺少关怀，关怀别人，就感恩对一些社会上的一些事情的这种这种。可能很少，包括像你们现在这种采访的这些活动，其实，在公立的学校或者是很少的，那都是在考考试嘛，不可能有这种课题，这种我觉得是非常少的。要有思维，这我相信是都是一样的，要有自己的想法，要把自己的想法写出讲出来，不要被别人，比如说国内的话，有可能老师是不让他有想法的，老师的想法就是 OK 的，但是我觉得。国际的家庭，不管欧美或者日本，所有的人都要听取对方的想法。你的想法是什么？按照你的想法去做，去解决问题，这是一个过程控制。我觉得这个应该两个任何一个这种欧美或者日本都是一样的。我们都希望孩子能够阳光的学习啊，然后生活上呢也是能够自理能力能够提高，快乐学习，就是说的吧、嗯？对，有出去看的，看世界的。呃，基本知识啊，基本的常识啊，这个就是教育的非常大的一个好的。呃，我觉得如果有机会能够到国外去拓开一下眼界的话，当然好，因为毕竟一个人的知识也好，阅历也好，其实是要要有通过多种的方式，包括一个很重要的方法，就是可能要到外面去看一看。去接触不同的人种，可能人家的教育是怎么样的，甚至欧美国家，包括日本这样的国家，去看人家的教育是怎么样。就像您说，这是两条线、嗯，但是如果有机会，你们会让你的孩子进入另外一条线，进入国际学校吗？或者是出国？呃，我觉得可以让他出去，就是接接触这种国际的那个教育，不同的那种理念，然后可以。可以让他去尝试，可以去让他去体。刚来到了其他，真的要走上社会的话，其实我还是挺欣赏国际学校，他针对问题的思维和解决能力这一块，呃，我还是比较欣赏的。所以我想将来在大学的时候，还是希望他到国外去学习的。We talked to Mr. Ken Ross, managing director for Asia at the Minerva Project. He founded the International Foundation for the Promotion of Academic Soft Skills. He's also a popular figure on TV on networks such as CCTV, China Business Network, ICS, and Bloomberg, where he speaks and provides commentary on issues involving international education. 首先，有的人就说，对于出国留学这个事情呢，我觉得从一开始可能有时候心态其实要要要摆好，要要要要调调调调节好。就是有的人就是心态没有弄好，那怎么说心态没调节好呢？就说你要看你你出国呃留学的目的是啥的，对吧？嗯，有的人就说有好几种，就是有那种盲目出国的啊，还有那种就是被逼出国的，就是说父母亲恩典。<笑><笑>有盲目的，就是那种出国的
听说呃出国留学还能够以后就说对事业的发展可能好啊，那、啊、就很盲目的，就是不知道自己为什么到底要出国，先要搞清楚的，我我要不要出国？我为什么要出国？对吧？出国，比如说对我来说有什么好处呢？对吧？那也许听起来很简单，应该出国留学应该对对大家有都有好处吧？也未必啊啊，有一些同学可能嗯。如果在国内读书，有些中国同学啊，然后可能就说，可能不是国际学校，也不是国际班啊，就是就是这个普通班，然后可能特别会考试，呃，国内就是应试教育，对吧？那如果你在应试教育的这个体制内，这个环境里面，你会很会考试啊，啊，你就喜欢这种体制，那就出国留学要干嘛？没有必要哈、啊。那当然，我们今天所说的、所讲的、所提的。不是这种人啊，就是可能就是那那些已经是在国际部里面，在国际班里面，或者可能也是普通班，但是是想要出国留学，但是先要搞清楚的，现在要把好，就是我到底为了出出国呢？呃，这个那个，然后再再再再往前想的，就是说，从不是再往后想，就是说，呃，接下来应该说，我应该想，哎，我应该。去哪里啊？对吧？应该参加，我是要中学出去的，还是我要大学出去，还是我要研究生出去的啊,啊？然后我要到底要去哪个国家啊？呃，到底要去读什么的啊？对吧？这些事情都要都要想想清楚的。我觉得很多人就说，在这个过程中，而且他在他们最终就说做这个决定的时候是太过于盲目。是的哈，就就就,就有中国特色啊，但是一旦是到了，特别那些是，呃，像英国啦、美国这种国家，特别是美国，非常重要的啊，你就说要意识到这一点，意识到有会有很多人不懂的没有关系，不懂的就去，不懂就去问呢啊,啊，对吧？不懂的自己去研究，现在有个东西叫做 Internet， 对吧？还有网络，有这么一个东东啊。呃，要开玩笑的，因为毕竟有有有这种东西，里面的资源是相当的丰富。不去了解，自我先说是自己去了解，不是靠其他的。OK， 那就是回复我跟我说的。呃，那还是假设一个人是想在本科这个阶段出国啊，我们先不要说除了中学还是研究生，先说本科。这样子的话，其实呃，我还是建议同学是在提前。三，起码三四年要开始做准备的，等于就是说，你初三最好，最晚你初三还得开始做准备。什么叫做准备呢？那个时候还不用太想到我到底就要去什么学校，不用。但是说你要开始了解到，比如说你我初二、初三的时候，就说又去去去开始了解说，哎。有想法，我可能出国留学 ，OK。那我去去了解这个某一些国家的教育的环境或者生活的环境是什么样子，是不是适合我啊？对吧？那如果现在有有就是说家庭有条件的同学，因为现在毕竟很多人还是有这个条件，我还是建议就是说，比如说你读完初初二是初三的那一年，那夏天想办法，不一定是一个人，你有时候太小，我是父母都会觉得太小。有条件、条件允许的情况下，去走一趟，甚至去参加一个不是这么中介去给你推荐的这种项项目，千万不要去参加这种中介的那种乱七八糟的项目，就会把把你跟一一大堆大堆中文就是这个堆在一起，就是在在在美国在什么地方那个杂堆的，没有什么意义。到一个什么那边的一个中学，他们都是很多美国的，比如说中学都会开放这个家庭。还有一点点夏令营的样子的，很多，对吧？都可以自己找，也不是不需要什么乱七八糟的中介帮你、帮你找。而且你自己找，也可以确保那个地方是是不是靠谱的。通过你自己的研究和了解，那你可以考虑在那个时候，因为如果你，比如说你初三、初三读完啊，还没有正式进入高中的时候，你那年夏天去美国一个月三个星期，我。
凡是我见过的这样做过的同学啊，很清楚的知道，哎，我到底喜不喜欢那样环境，很清楚的啊。很多人就说啊，我很喜欢；有的人说啊，我未必很喜欢，我可能留在国内啊。那就很清楚的，你这样子的话，你到了呃高一啊，就是你你，如果你真的不想出国的话，那就说好，留在普通班里面就就够了，真的不。也未必要考虑，就说读读国际班，是不是？但如果你到了呃，出了那个到了，体验了那那个那一个月的，在国外的，以后嘛，你会觉得哦，我现在比较喜欢这种环境，我现在比较适合这种环境，这个环境说说不定还让我那个更加开心。好，那说明那个可能出国的我就是适合你的。那这样的话，你就可以从初三或者你可以最晚可以从高一就开始的。怎么样开始的？那当然，这个语言要一直在一直在补。哪怕你在国际部里、国际班里面，估计大部分同学还是要注意到这个语言的。另外呢，嗯，除了就是说在好好在学校里面好好的读书和补语言以外呢，啊，这些比较硬实力的，你还开始补你的软实力啊。因为美国的大学就是说，我们不要忘记这个比重啊，就说差不多一半一半，大致上来讲。要看你的 SAT 成绩，就是所谓的美国的高考，对吧？也是要看你的学校里面的成绩的。但是除了这以外嘛，他也要看你其他的软实力的指标啊，什么样指标？他要看你这个人，就说批判性的思维啊，表现在哪里？表现在你哪些课外活动和课外的成就上？活动是不够的，最最好的学校还是要看你的成就。你的 achievements， 你的 accomplishments， 你所做过什么，或者是你所参加过什么，不一样的。这些你可要开始，要开始挖掘一些什么兴趣爱好出来，或者可能硬逼着自己就是去尝试一些什么些什么东西。最晚就高一就开始。Mr. Richard Lin is the managing director for Asia Pacific at World Strides, the United States' largest and most trusted education travel organization. And exclusive educational travel partner of the 100,000 Strong Foundation, Richard Lin has more than a decade worth of experience working with students in both China and Hong Kong. The mistakes Chinese students make when preparing for studying abroad、um, come, I think, from a focus on just the rankings of the schools and not really understanding themselves and what schools are a better fit. For the student, so this could mean,、um, you know, as the student, are you more comfortable in a school that has large class sizes and minimal time with the instructors or with the professors, or do you prefer an environment where it's more intimate? So there's less students、um, in a class, and that、uh, you have more face-to-face -face time、uh, with the instructor or the professors. Um, also, one of the things that I think a student should understand is what teaching style is more conducive, you know, to their learning. I mean, there are many different teaching styles, and then there are schools where the professor does not spend any time with you as an undergrad because the professor has many different research projects, and and they actually spend more time with their grad program or their PhD students,、uh, their doctor students, than undergrad students. Um, whereas certain schools like liberal arts colleges, you know, focus specifically, you know, on just the students、um, and so forth. So, I think that's very important.、Um, I think another thing that people don't look into as much is also the region, you know, where you're going to be studying. What type of opportunities are in that region, you know, that the school you're going to be going to. So, what subjects or what career plans、um, are you interested in? It, does that region offer those opportunities? Can you do maybe not? It, it could be internship, it could be work opportunities, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's for research. Maybe you're if you're in a specific region, you can find out more about that career opportunity. You can talk to people、uh, and meet people, leaders in that industry. If you're in the right region, if you're not, then maybe those opportunities aren't available to you. So these are things I think that Chinese students really. Gloss over and, and miss when they are applying for school because the focus is always on I want to go to a higher rank school, higher rank school. But when you're looking at rankings, the school that's ranked number thirty and the school that's ranked number forty, what, what's the difference? Right? What What is the difference at the end of the day? 
when at, when you come back and the skills that you could have developed at the number forty school in the region that was more uh, that was more um, better suited for you, or I gave you more op more opportunities, um, you know, and versus going to a number three school. Mr. Jeremy Galia is head of the ESL program and International Languages Department at Columbia International College, the largest university preparatory boarding school in Canada. The universities are not only looking at academic performance. They also want to see student involvement in uh, other organizations, whether it's volunteer or student groups or charities. They really want to see that the student is somebody who will be a good contributor to the university. They want to bring students to the university that are well-rounded. This means someone who can study and have good marks in the class, but also someone that can help others and, and take on other leadership or uh, charity work uh, and can grow in other ways. When you look at the faces and hear the stories of Chinese students and their families, it's hard not to feel for them. Many have placed all of their hope, time, and money on the idea of studying abroad. They believe that going to the West for school is the start of a better future. However, the education market is filled with bad information. Education, as it stands today, is a business, and those with the largest advertising budget are those whose voices are heard the most often. Unfortunately, those who have the means to disseminate information are also those who have vested interests and no motivation to change the current state of affairs. There seems to be no push to tell the truth about studying abroad. The role of so-called education consultants and study abroad services comes to mind. Wu 出国留学的这种资讯的这种公司往往这些公司的利益跟你的利益所以说如果除非你自己去了解去掌握情况 there that that are I would say unscrupulous um, in their practices uh, those companies that promise you to get you into schools of you know this ranking or above or they will continue to help you if you did not or getting you a test score of X number but if you don't get that test score you can continue to study at that school I think um, some of these practices uh, I don't necessarily agree with and you should be aware of, of these organizations. But again, you know, there are education consultants who, who are genuinely interested in helping and will help make you better. This doesn't mean that all education agencies are untrustworthy, but it does mean that one needs to be more careful when choosing who to ask for help. 
Also, it would be a much better idea for students and families themselves to learn more about the application process and Western education in general. This club was established by our business teacher Arthur. Uh, in the beginning, I found my two friends, Steven and Peter, and.、Uh, I talked to the and they were also interested in this club too. So three of us joined in. I think the business club、uh, gave us an opportunity to learn something out of the class,、uh, and I think it's it will help us in the future. Last semester we are working on、uh, school T-shirt, and uh, uh, Stephen Dong and、uh, all the members in business club are. Doing that, and so this this T-shirt is our product. You can see at the back,、uh, there's a pattern of fire. So、um, we are we worked with art club, and、uh, they give the design. And after this, we order this tea and、uh, contact with the online shop,、uh, and、uh, we sold the T-shirt to almost. Every student in our international school. We start、uh, the music club、uh, in our grade ten semester because、uh, the the music band is basically. Uh, need uh, every team members cooperate together. That makes the good music. Can、um, you tell me what you are you doing right now?、Uh, I'm doing the、uh, I'm doing the charity poster,、uh, which is on the day after tomorrow. What are you going to sell during charity?、Um, I will be in charge of selling food, and I will sell、um, pop popcorn and、uh, happy cola. <laughs> We have a public show in thirties, and our our dancing lading with a great time student、uh, whose name is Jack, and、uh, our our song is thinking out of love, thinking out of love. The first time I heard、uh, our teacher let us do this documentary, I feel excited because it's my first time to do to do a movie, and、uh, that's the thing I only can see that on TV. But now I can do it by myself. I think、uh, it's a, a pretty good chance to let me practice my、uh, skills, and、uh, it can help me grow. And nowadays. More and more Chinese students are making mistakes、uh, about studying English and the、uh, reason why they want to go abroad. But I think their reason is just mainly because first they are rich, they just want to go abroad. The second one is that if you are more and more Chinese students go abroad, so they just follow them and they go abroad. They have no idea what what should they do and they make a lot of mistake about learning English. So this documentary is talking about the learning English and、uh, the international education. We know that students are under a tremendous amount of pressure these days, but most of us only think of the side that's connected with getting good grades. We often forget that students are people too, with their own lives and their own worries. We think of students as children, but this is an oversimplified way of thinking about things. We shouldn't forget that each student is a unique individual, and that they have concerns and worries all their own. Easy to become mad and lose my temper. Maybe it's because you have more pressure in your life. Yeah, but 
Um, I I felt it before, and I can control it. But now, when I become mad, I uh, I just maybe shout at Taylor, my friend. Mm. So I think, and after the, <laughs> after this happens, and I will feel I'm sorry. And I think she is lack of self confidence because when she practiced the reading part, mm. if she uh, gets uh, many mistakes, mm. uh, she will think uh, she uh, her English is bad, and maybe he she will do bad at the else, real else test, mm. and she going to do practice and <coughs> the. Do you have any idea what kinds of things make you mad, or is like everything makes you mad? Um, almost everything. Oh, but but I uh, like um, to my mom and dad or mm -hmm. Gary. I I will. Uh, <laughs> I will what? I I will not. I will not lose my temper. You won't lose your temper because I try to control myself and. Okay. And the temper uh, become uh, focused on Taylor. Maybe. So, is it with your mom and dad and Gary you don't get mad or you just don't show your anger? Don't show anger. Well, I guess that means that Taylor is a real <laughs> friend then, if you feel that you can show her your anger. She is thinking about her major in the university. And Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she says she wants to become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But she is wondering if she wants to try it because it's hard to become a lawyer. I will go to Canada soon, so I have to pass else exam. <laughs> as as for me, I think uh, else exam is difficult. Um, since um, I am a very sensitive girl, I, I always uh, very nervous when I. Taking exam, um, and I think uh, uh, while while doing the speaking exam, I will explode. <laughs> really, that's really that's that's that that, that is my that, that is my true feeling. I was uh, practicing, I was reading, and it was so hard for me. Really, I don't know why I can't uh, concentrate on that. Maybe, maybe, maybe I already think uh, I can't uh, do a good job in the middle exam, so I don't have enough confidence to. To finish it. Why? Why? Uh, why? It's most my whole life. I think it's just very common. And, uh, I'm not. I become I'm not very emotional. So if I do something or gain something, I just have the same emotion. It's very cool. Do you think that's a bad thing? No, I just want my life has some uh, eternity, but you know I don't have the uh, same feeling as before. Uh, before I'm very emotional, and uh, if I get a good grade, um, I will be very excited and I smell every day like this. But if I absent one class or or do some point um, because of my uh, I didn't uh, sweep question very carefully. I will feel upset for a long time, not very long time, uh, but I will feel upset. But, but recently, although I want to be better, but I don't have uh, motivation. Uh, I don't have enthusiasm on, on my study. Oh, I have when, when I taking when I'm taking class, uh, I will answer the question. But you know the participation, the teacher will write down the, your name if you participate. 
uh, after teacher write down my name, I just do nothing. Uh, like, uh, think, think about other things or talk to my classmate. I think uh, this is not the life I really want. Uh, I like um, before. Uh, you know, uh, when, I'm, when I studied in grade 10, if I want to do something, I will um, do it quickly. You know, if I, I have any uh, thought, I will uh, let it become true. But uh, not, although I want to be true or want to make it become true or I want to do something, um, but But I think um, I will um, put it off or do something else. So, although I want to do something, I, I won't pay attention on it. I think the time is limited. I need to, um, I need to be quick, quick on um, preparing it. But I just don't want to prepare it. You know, the feeling. I, I think this is natural for everybody at some point in their life you can't you can't go 100 percent 100 percent of the time that's impossible i, I want to tell you is i want to be better but i do nothing all tests will come okay well think about it this way your ielts test is something that you just need to pass yeah and it is something that you will need to pass no matter what you do in the future yeah. Right, because you are going to Canada, mm -hmm. so you need an IELTS test score. I actually don't think you will have any problem with your IELTS test, so I don't worry I, so much about it. I have a problem with my listening and reading. Mm -hmm. You know, listening, I think uh, while, while I have a communicate with a uh, foreign teacher, it's totally okay, I can understand every single word, but while I listen to tape on the old test um, I cannot understand them I have a lot of goals but you know today I, I want to choose this one tomorrow I choose that one the day after tomorrow I have well I would have a new one I just uh, cannot be you no know, stable For better or for worse, one of the areas that international students are most focused on are standardized language tests, such as the TOEFL test, or the test of English as a foreign language, and the IELTS test, or the International English Language Testing System. But are these students studying in the right way? Are the materials that they're using even good materials? Mr. Anthony Yu is an English for Academic Purposes specialist. He has more than 10 years experience working with Chinese students and is also a former IELTS examiner of many years with the British Council. As nowadays with development of yeah. technology, yes, yes uh, that is one of our biggest uh, peeves, um, things that we hate the most in IELTS. Um, yes, language schools will want you to learn that because it's the easiest to teach. Yeah, basically just teaching you a set of phrases which they claim are going to help you improve your marks. But remember, if they teach it to you, they're going to teach it to another student and another student. Which means if, for example, 600 students have come from the same language school, 600 students are going to say the same thing to us. So we know that's something that you've prepared. I can tell you this, under those circumstances, because most of the IELTS, in fact, no, sorry, all of the IELTS examiners have been trained in such a way where we can actually tell if someone has been practicing English using a formula. 
because the way they speak, their mannerisms, their, their eye contact, their um, fluency, pronunciation, we can tell very easily that they're not speaking naturally. So under those circumstances, both cases, we wouldn't award them a high mark. It just might be that maybe this candidate have, has prepared for a topic that just so happened got asked during the exam. But even if that's the case, that candidate wouldn't do very well. This student has to show them that they have the ability to survive when they go overseas, whether it's Canada or America or the UK. If you're unable to show that you have the language skills to survive both in the classroom as well as outside, then technically you shouldn't be going abroad. We know from before that Chinese students may be studying English in the wrong way. But did you know that even the materials they're using could be hurting them instead of helping them? Let's take a look at some of the books that are commonly used. This book tells you that you can conquer the IELTS test in just 10 days. Is that even possible? Language is a really complicated thing. How do you conquer it in 10 days? And why would you use a book that's lying to you from the very cover? Here's a book that tells you it has a word list of 807 IELTS vocabulary words. What are IELTS vocabulary words? Are they any different from normal English words? Yes. But looking inside, we can see that there seems to be more Chinese than English. How do you use Chinese to learn English? This is an IELTS book that is made for writing. So, let's look inside. What's this? A model answer? Another model answer? From our interviews with IELTS testers before, we know that the kind of answers they hate the most are these modeled, scripted kinds of answers. Do you really want to use this book? What does this book say? What's that? Write down the answer as soon as you pick up your pen? How do you do well in anything if you don't have time to think about it first? Another IELTS vocabulary book. Is there even a real IELTS vocabulary list? I'm not sure about that, but what's inside? What's the difference between this book and a dictionary? It's not even a very good dictionary. There's nothing to do in this book. By now, you already understand that standardized language tests are only one of the factors that will decide the success or failure of an international student. But, undeniably, these tests are still one of the main issues that students stress about and focus the most on. Unfortunately, even the way that students are preparing for these tests seems to be wrong. The first question they should ask themselves is, what is a language test testing me on? There are too many students that approach these huge language tests, such as the IELTS and the TOEFL tests, as an achievement test. An achievement test is designed to measure a person's level of accomplishment or knowledge in a specific area. So in other words, how much you can remember. <clears throat> Different from an achievement test is the proficiency test. This is a kind of aptitude test that was designed to assess what a person is capable of doing. This test attempts to gauge a person's potential to learn or do things in the future. Basically, with the results of this test, we can make guesses about how successful people can be in using their knowledge and skills to achieve tasks. Most of the students in China are approaching the IELTS and the TOEFL test as an achievement test, but guess what kind of test they really are. That's right, they're proficiency tests. I know that even after everything you've learned so far, you're still asking yourself the question, how can I do well on a standardized language test? Well, the answer is simple. All you need to do is have good language skills. So, in actuality, the real question you should be asking yourself is, how do I achieve good language skills? Let's think about this question in a different way. Maybe you're the kind of person that likes basketball, and you hope to become a better player in the future. Well, 
You could be like this person and watch 10 hours of basketball on TV every day. You'll probably have a really good time, but do you think you'll become a better basketball player? Of course not. Language is the same way. You could sit in front of your book and study 10 hours a day, but in the end you won't be able to use the language in any meaningful way. Chances are you won't even have a good time. Language is a skill, and skills are muscles. If you want big muscles, you have to go to the gym and work out. That means when you're learning languages, you have to use them to communicate in real-world situations and try to accomplish tasks with the language. That also means that any good international school would be an English-only zone. When discussing the reasons why students seem to be perpetually in the wrong mindset and focusing on the wrong things in education, we cannot overlook the role of cram schools. Called Bushiban in China, Juku in Japan, and Hagwon in Korea, cram schools are everywhere in Asia. They lure students and parents in with the promises of higher test scores. They say they'll teach you the tricks and the skills needed to score well. But let me ask you a question. When's the last time you had to take a test at your job, or in your life? For your driver's license, maybe? Anything else? Actually, test scores are just a distraction thrown out by cram schools to stop you from realizing that they're selling you a mostly useless product that isn't going to help you in life. Still, cram schools are an ingrained and inescapable part of life for many East Asian students as the school systems in this part of the world tend to be very test-oriented. It seems that everybody goes, but nobody asks the question. Is going to cram schools useful? Is there any real teaching and learning happening in cram schools? Do they even really raise your test scores like they promise? In terms of the private training schools, I, I have no confidence in them, to say the very least, because I've, I've come across many uh, private language schools. I used to work at one myself. I know how it works internally, and unfortunately many of those so-called trainers are not really qualified because they don't know how an actual IELTS test actually functions. So it's all about trying to prepare students to take a test based on a formula which is actually being prepared for the trainers and to help um, basically students to learn everything off by heart which is the last thing we want to see when you're taking. Maybe the language schools they think that they have 
all of the latest questions. But by the time the candidates go and practice at the language schools and they go to the exams, we would have changed the question. Well, I think that's the biggest problem with regards to um, IELTS candidates today. Everyone's aiming for a particular number. And um, from an educational point of view, that's what we refer to as um, instrumental motivation. People actually studying something because they simply want to get from X to Y. So most of the students studying IELTS, it's not about trying to improve or show that they have a good language ability. It's simply just because it's one thing that they have to pass before they get from China to wherever it is that they want to go. And as a result of that, we go back to the issue of private language schools because they know that this is something that most Chinese students have to do and it becomes a very lucrative market for them because they obviously are benefiting from students' willingness to actually pass this test. For the students' point of view, it's not about you know, studying language because they have to um, generally use it in the future, it's just simply about passing the exam. In the end, the only people that have the ability to change this educational situation are the consumers themselves. It's time to stop kidding yourselves and stop listening to lies. There are no tricks to tests. There is no IELTS or TOEFL word list. High test scores don't mean anything in the real world. Stop wasting your time, your money, and your lives. The only way to succeed in academics and in life is to study the right way. True understanding is only achieved when you are able to apply the knowledge. Remember, true understanding leads to good test scores, but good test scores does not mean you have true understanding. All the experts that we talked to earlier said that focusing on test scores is not the correct way towards approaching learning and it's not even a good way to improve your test scores. But since everybody likes to focus on them, let's take a look at some of the numbers and see what the numbers tell us. Here we visit the IELTS official web page and we can see information about test taker performance from the year of 2013, the most recent year that we could gather information on. This chart shows the mean band scores and overall scores of the 40 most frequent places of origin. China is shown in blue and has an average overall test score of 5.7, ranking it number 27 out of 40 countries. Korea came in at number 22 and Japan tied China for number 27. Looking at official data from the TOEFL test of 2014, we get a similar picture. This chart here classifies test takers and test scores by native country of origin. Again, China is shown in blue and has an average total score of 77 points, placing it at number 113 out of 169 countries. Japan came in at number 138 with Korea faring slightly better at number 65. So, why is it that these three representative countries of East Asia seem to have such difficulties with English language tests? Their students are certainly widely known as some of the hardest working in the world. There are those that would argue that there just isn't an environment to learn English in these countries. But that doesn't explain, for example, why China ranked lower in the IELTS and TOEFL scores than countries such as Thailand, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Vietnam, Malaysia, and even North Korea. All of these countries are also Asian countries where the first language is not English. Again, the way that students are studying the language is what's hurting them. Let's think about what these three countries have in common. Japan could be considered the origin of cram schools, and Korea has the highest proportion of students studying in cram schools. Finally, China has the highest total number of students studying in cram schools. It's clear that the students here are just learning English the wrong way. The cram school mentality and rote memorization culture is hurting students in a way that is clearly shown by the numbers.
the group member that we decide to let them in is not uh, hardworking enough. Some of them, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Just like for, for example, today I'm feel sick and I go to a bathroom. But during that time, Peter told me to carry a camera, go to a playground, and uh, uh, I want to go to the bathroom. So I just talk, told Fred that uh, you have to look for the camera. We need it. And then I go to the bathroom. And when I come back, I see I saw Fred sit on that that desk and. I said, what are you doing? And he said nothing. And I asked him, did you bring a camera go to a cam uh, playground? Uh, he said no. And I said, why? He said, uh, I don't know where is the camera. So I asked him, did you look for the camera? Did you find it? And he said no. And then I'm, I'm so angry. So uh, I, I start uh, not talking to him. And then uh, I saw Peter is playing basketball on the playground, and then I even more than angry. And after that, I see Don is playing basketball too. So I feel even more angry than before. Mm -hmm. So when they come back, I just shout at them. The other problem is that if we make a goal, we said we have to do it today. But when they this day is over, and uh, the result is we are not finished it. So it moved to the next next day. And the same things happen. We can't finish finish it either. I'm setting the schedule but they are not following it. And every day I told them you should do it. Should should do it. But they just say, Oh okay, okay and then after I ask them and they answer me that we're not finish it. It distract my schedule. My schedule said today we have to finish it and tomorrow we should finish it. But when they do that, they can't finish it, so we have to change the schedule again. It's slow my schedule down, so we probably can't finish it on time if they still not finish what I am decide to finish today. I talk to them every day, and every day Peter comes to the classroom, I will tell him what should, what should we do today. But he will always forget, and I should always remind him what should you do. But after I remind him, and he still forget about that. But in the end, the result is I have to uh, write a paper to get a camera. I should carry the camera and set the schedule and tell them what should they do. And in the end, they will not I finish it. Uh, it's, I don't know how to gather them together. Well, uh, both of them have very strong ideas. Yeah. The, because usually if we want to film a movie or video, we need a very uh, powerful and strong uh, script. And the script is, of course, for sure, is very, very complicated. And um, we don't have this one. So when I give my idea to, to the team, uh, we always have disagreements. Once we have disagreements, then all the problem belongs uh, to the script. Mm -hmm. So we keep talking about the plot and, and the, how, how, the, how the whole documentary is um, moving is how to show on the screen uh, for, uh, for one month. Right now we're like, in February, we knew we are going to f to do the documentary. Mm -hmm. In March, we, are, we know that we, we are still talking about how to film. And right now, in April, it's, uh, we still have disagreements. And the team members, they don't really want to do it. They don't want to move to carry the camera or uh, like do things. Cause one problem is, uh, I think, is the the time is really uh, limited. Mm. We like we only got the lunch time and the after after school before the evening study this period of time. So and also the the actor, um, uh, the 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 students that we follow or we, we want to film, uh, they also have the same schedule with us. So. We like we are not like cooperate. Yeah. It's documentary, so it has to be true. It's t it has to be a natural. Um, the reason why why we change the the, the way 
as uh, to be a team and uh, separately uh, is because uh, the teams find uh, if they are the directors of every uh, the, uh, of of the students we follow, then they don't because I'm in charge of whole whole documentary, mm -hmm. so they want to know uh, what my idea is, then they can film. So which means it's still me. Uh, it's I'm still there to to give the direction to give the like, uh, instructions to give them to let them to do that. And um, so which means. Uh, I am uh, a little bit too busy and uh, they also want to be separate because everyone has their skills like Steven like uh, he's really good at like the the uh, the uh, cutting and uh, the, the the videos and Judy maybe she is scheduling right now and um, so if we can make if so we decide to if we can make the team as one so everyone has their skills and we can or together to do this to do this one thing maybe stronger than before no Fred I don't know why before he's really uh, he's kind of passionate about this he give advices and suggestions it's really good to see this side and um, I, I I accept his ideas and after I don't know today he's just his attitude becomes ah uh, I don't do it is there I I ask why because you can do this we're making it and he told me uh, is there a reason for me just I don't want to do it it's like they don't really uh, care because maybe Fred doesn't care. About Judy and Steven, they they have their thoughts and they always like have a crit critical uh, opinion about what uh, what my plan. Like today, there is a situation. I thought there is a basketball competition, okay. so I told them to get the camera because I'm going to have the competition. And oh, okay. Judy told Fred, Fred, say I don't want to do it. Then Judy come back. Then Tom take it, mm -hmm. took took it to the playground. And Don is playing the basketball over another side of the court. So Judy and Steven feel like the group is is gone. There is no one support there. There's no one uh, over there to 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 do this. I look. I always. Tell them we are a group. We are making it. We don't. We always want to uh, cover the position that I'm the leader. I'm very high. I want to like. Uh, we're just classmates, and we are doing this. There's no, not like you have to do what I say. But so I don't know. Maybe that's why we always have disagreements and. If I do something like a little bit wrong, then they just blame me as uh, I don't know how strong they are. And this doesn't happen in other clubs. I know because you guys care more about it, and you're good at these things. So of course, that's the way. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. There's no problem we can't take care of. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your work. See ya. Hello everyone, uh, we are two group members from our school band Disrespectful Masters. And we are going to have a competition on Sunday, 24th May, in the Mercedes Benz Arena, the mixing room. Uh, and the competition called uh, Battle of the Band is a, a competition between international high school bands. And we feel excited about, uh, about it. And we hope that you can join us. We faced a lot of problems, but we never gave gives up. But sometimes we do think we will give up because that's too hard. But 
but after a while, we after we calm down and we think that we can't give up because uh, if you don't try it, then that means you are useless. So uh, we decide to pick it up and uh, uh, fight for it. We use the whole afternoon to um, maybe only uh, make one or two shots. We are still working on it, and uh, I hope the students. Uh, both the international student or domestic student can learn something from this this documentary. I hope this documentary can help them. As we learned before, many Chinese students are focusing on the wrong things in their quest towards studying abroad. Too many believe that passing tests equals success and a bright future. What they don't realize is that the truly important skills are the ones that they work the least on. The learning of English is one area in which Chinese students are mistaken in their methods and their goals. Too many students approach the learning of English with the goal of doing well on English tests. Even many teachers approach the teaching of English with the same goal in mind. What they've forgotten is that English is a language, and language is a tool. If English is not learned to be used, then why learn English at all? One of the things that I, don't, I think that Chinese students don't, don't do enough of is active learning versus passive learning. So active learning is where you actually go out and use English, right? Use people, use English with other, with your classmates, with native speakers, with, you know, your teachers, um, and, and so forth. Find opportunities and events where you have an opportunity to apply what you have learned. You, because your passive learning, you're reading it from the book, you're watching it from movies, or you're watching it from TV shows, that's great. But if you don't use it, you'll never know, you know, how you ne you never really store it um, in your in your um, active use memory. So I think that's one of the things that people you know miss, and so you have to actively use it. Okay, um, and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, because we all make mistakes, you know, in language. And at the end of the day, and I can tell you from my many years of working experience that it's okay to make mistakes. Your English does not have to be perfect. We're, most of us are not going to be uh, here to write books right, in, in English. Uh, we're here to use it as a communications tool. And as long as the other person understands you know, what, you're, what you're thinking and what your points are and how you support your points, that's fine. That's fine. So don't be afraid. And as you use it, and you'll find that most people don't judge you for make, making a mistake here or there. Um, and once you, once you have that, and once you use that, you'll find that you know, it's not a big deal. And your confidence goes right up. And once you're more confident, your English is gonna improve. And once you, you, know, you make a mistake a couple times, that's okay, you understand where you made the mistakes and you won't make it again. And that's really how you improve your English. Another area that Chinese students should be working on but are not is the ability to think critically and explore unfamiliar areas of life. This may be because of Chinese students' obsession with finding the correct answer. Teachers in this respect are guilty as well, with many classes focused on achieving high scores, but not real learning. They've forgotten about the importance of the learning and thinking process, and put too much emphasis on these so-called correct answers. Actually, in real life, there are many different ways to arrive at an answer, but there are very few answers that are totally correct. Possibly the most important skill that a high school student can acquire is the ability to learn by themselves. As students move on to higher education, they will find that there is less structure and greater freedom. College professors do not chase students around all the time and tell them what to do and when. Sometimes it's even up to the students themselves to find the needed information. 
The role of a teacher is simply to help the students that wish to learn. Many students struggle for returns on education in U.S. It is a news story from the Wall Street Journal. In this article, it's explained that many Chinese students struggle to acclimate to their new Western educational settings. It's also explained that the analytical and critical thinking abilities that are so emphasized in Western schools present an insurmountable barrier for some Chinese students. Another rather discouraging news article comes from the International Business Times. It's mentioned that even the best and the brightest Chinese students attending Ivy League universities experience a 25% dropout rate. It's explained that many of the Chinese students find it difficult to adjust and adapt to their new environment. Two of the largest barriers mentioned are the language problem and also differences in the education systems. So what exactly happens to international students who are not truly prepared? A photojournalism project by Darcy Holdorf from the Scripps School of Journalism at Ohio University titled Not Here or There tells the story perfectly. One quote from the project reads, Passage into the realm of authentic American life is rare because the Chinese students tend to stay together, isolating themselves from American culture. Pictured here is Andy Liu, one of the students followed in this photo documentary. Andy comes from Tianjin, China. He says he would like to make more American friends, but finds that the underground party culture is hard to relate to. After two years at Ohio University, Andy is still a full-time student in the Ohio program of intensive English, and he has yet to take a single engineering class, his chosen major. He spends hours at a time preparing for the TOEFL exam. This May, he will take the test for the sixth time. He says, you study the same thing again and again. I see no hope. I see no end. Known on campus as Chinatown, Scott Quad is a dormitory where 180 of the 215 residents are Chinese. Students complain that it's hard to speak English or meet American friends when they live with so many other Chinese students. After class, it's always a close-knit circle of Chinese friends where no English can be heard. Many Chinese students lose touch with the U.S. campus culture immediately after their arrival. Although Scott Quad is a non-smoking dormitory, many Chinese students get caught smoking in their rooms. Here we see a group of friends making noodles in their dorm room. Cooking is forbidden in this dorm, so a plastic bag covers the smoke detector to avoid getting caught. At 2 a.m. on the third floor lounge, we see four 18-year-old residents playing mahjong. Pictured here is Bill Zhang, 20 years old. He's been at Ohio University for six months, socializes mostly with Chinese students, and has very few American friends. For international students like Bill, who are in English classes full-time, it is difficult to integrate into American culture. I think one of the things that Chinese students, um, and I've been in the U.S., and I grew up in the U.S. and I've had a lot of Chinese classmates. And one of the bigger issues that my Chinese classmates and other international students faced was not reaching out, not networking with your American uh, professors, your American colleagues, and your classmates. And I think that is something that you know can be very valuable. Uh, in China, we all talk about Huan Xi, right? And how valuable and how helpful Huan Xi can be, you know, having a network. But in, it, it's the same everywhere else, and it's the same in the U.S. So reaching out early, knowing, taking advantage of that, and uh, build your network, not just with your Chinese classmates, but with your American classmates, your professors, the career development office, you know, and opportunities that will come. If you don't do it, the opportunities will never come. 对，这个就是所谓的，呃，呃，就说是。
，就是说眼镜宽出嘛，还是眼镜年初啊，这个同学，很多人就说中国学校是眼镜但是宽出，对吧？就是你一旦是进了啊，那就是呃，这四年当中也未必就非常调整非常非常的大哈，就可能没有那么没有像你考进去那么难，就这样。那相对来说，很多国外的学校是，呃，它也有严禁的哈、啊，呃，也有宽禁的，也有严禁的。但是相对国内的，那可能也是比较严出一点。为什么呢？你被一个学校录取了，你所谓的考进去的，不是真正的考，是被录取的。你被耶鲁录取，你被斯坦福那个，你被哥大那个，要是是哥大，你被哥大录取的哈。他说好，看好你的，但是没完呢，对吧？你还得就是说时时刻刻的一直在那边表现着，对吧？意思就是说，对啊，你在读书的时候，你如果你在那边就说读的不及格哈、啊，那学校就说就就给你让你一个非要就会请你走啊，对啊，好的学校不怕这样子的啊。不怕就说你你不及格的，那可能一次你一门课不及格，你可能就不至于因为这样子让你走了嘛。就说，呃，他们也会就说，呃，给予你更多的那个资源，什么呃，有很多人也可以辅导嘛。就说那个呃，各方面的人要来支持你啊。但是如果你那边一直说是你不管，如果你明显就说是不要去读书嘛，你你你以为啊，我就可以考进去的，然后我就那边轻轻松松在那边待个什么几年，那个几年，呃，就是出来就混个文凭出来。那不行的，真的不行。好学校不是这样子，好学校好是天天要考验你，考验你。我觉得是应该的，真的是应该的，就让这个文凭啊，让这这张纸更值，对吧？啊、呃，所以说大概他们就是就是就是这样说的。最好的学校是，呃，会对学生有一定的要求，而且一直会有要求。So in Jia, interviewed in the earlier Wall Street Journal article, is a student at North Carolina State University. She's seemingly in the minority of Chinese students who are actually succeeding in the West. She says, "I think many Chinese students are wasting their money. They spend a lot of money to come, but if you're here to hang out with the Chinese in America, why don't you just go back to study in China?" She also says, "If you just come to study and only hang out with Chinese people, all you bring back with you back to China is the diploma." It's a piece of paper. That's it. In actuality, as is shown from our earlier photo documentary project, even receiving the diploma is not a guarantee. With many students returning to China after many years and tens of thousands of dollars wasted, and nothing to show for it. After seeing these stories and hearing about past experiences. You're no doubt asking yourself the question: Why are all these students going abroad if they can't use English? Why didn't they prepare before they went abroad? The sad truth is that, because of incorrect study methods, bad information, and false beliefs, the majority of Chinese students are not prepared. Almost everyone can answer questions on an English test, but how many can use the language to actually achieve a task? Without the necessary skills and the correct attitude, or even a goal, how can a student succeed? Seven point oh, can they adapt the environment when they go overseas?、Uh. I can tell you, it doesn't matter how high your IELTS score is. Adapting to a brand new environment is always challenging. Right. Yes, you might possess the language ability, but remember, going to the West is very different than here in China. There's a different system of manners and、um, understanding how、um, all the different、um, things that you have to come across work, like banking and living in a dormitory with other foreigners. All of those require time to adapt. But the good thing is, if you're able to communicate, right, naturally, this will become easy. If you aren't able able to speak English properly, and you go overseas, and you, you know your roommate is, for example, someone from Canada,、um, trying to understand and communicate some of your、um, your issues with that person becomes problematic, and before you know it, the distance becomes further. Right, you feel as if you, that your roommate doesn't understand you, and you don't want to understand your roommate, and then you know it becomes a very big cultural divide. So, does all this mean that Chinese students shouldn't go abroad? Is studying in the West a bad idea? Of course not. 
but students need to be prepared with the right attitude and work ethic when studying abroad, just like in China. For young high school students, facing the pressures of school and their future life is a daunting task. We talked to two individuals who seem to have done quite well for themselves, Mr. Feng Lam and Mr. David Rossi, who both graduated with master's degrees in management from Cornell University, and are also co-owners of Shanghai's immensely popular fortune cookie restaurant. When you're comfortable for your entire life, that's when you don't grow. Like growth happens by really looking at your weaknesses, understanding like this is making me uncomfortable, and as long as you're not doing anything that's like illegal or going to hurt your your health or your body, like I suggest really trying to push the limit of your comfortable boundaries and trying to learn、uh, from that time because it's only a short amount of time, and and to try to shy away and find things that you're comfortable with that remind you of home. I don't think is the best way that you could spend your、uh, university years, especially since you're picking to go abroad. You should really take advantage of all those differences and and、um, you know just face all of your challenges head on instead of trying to shy away from things.竞争啊，就说其实人家问的问题就就像我说的，我们怎么样的面对这个这种未来，怎么样面对未来？特别是我们现代这个社会的未来，一个就说变化那么那么迅速的一个一种一种时间里，就说我们就预测不出明年会
，或者你是不是你现在吃吃些服在服一些其他的药？因为可能我这种药可能就是跟你就在可能跟你那那种可能会撞车的状况，对吧？可能有一些。可能抵消的状况，或者可能一些，甚至可能一些，对于你那个那个身体可能会有一些那个不良的反应，对吧？他就问这个问题，这是一个让脑子思想到这种二等反应的一个思维习惯啊，对吧？这个思维习惯也可以用在，不只是用在医疗方面，用在很多很多不同的状况，对吧？所以说，如果你这种习惯，因为有很多应该说有成千上万的几百个这种思维习惯，如果一个人最起码哈，这个叫做 how to think。如果你通过四年大学，你能够培养自己，就是能够 how to think， 不是 what to think。我我刚刚说的这个课本知识也可以，就就总也读个专业嘛。但是你大部分你会忘记的。但是这些思维习惯，如果你练得够成熟，你不会忘记的。呃，我觉得这个问题很困难。那呃，虽然你们目前读的是一个 international school， 但是因为你的整个 family life， 还有你的 daily life， 其实你是在中国这样子一个充满竞争的社会。那呃呃，从我在在上海待了十多年的经验，其实你的每一天、每一分、每一秒，其实都存在无时无刻存在的一些竞争，那这是无可避免的。呃，但是我觉得，呃，竞争这件事情，不要把得失心看得太重。你需要设定一个个人目标，你希望取得自己的一些呃规划上的突破、生涯上的突破、学业上的突破，这是合理的。但是呃，不要把这个得失心放得太重。然后尽可能的，我认为是要去享受你的生活，享受你的学习，享受你的这个在学校的这些友情，还有透过这个不断的享受的过程当中，去挖掘你自己真正想做些什么事情。那我觉得能够得到这个，能够知道自己真正想要做什么事情，那或许会比那个呃透过竞争而得到这个地步，你未来所带来的成就感。可能更大一些，而且可能在不知不觉当中你会更成功。Filming the documentary, we meeting a lot of new people. We meeting the other director. We meeting uh, we, with with those uh, professional uh, teacher in those universities. It feels really good to to get with new stuff. And also, meanwhile, I'm really tired because uh, we're doing this over and over again. I think just repeat. Filming and uh, interview and just for the documentary. I hope the documentary will be f finished soon. So I really want to see the product we make. Uh, and uh, so far we are making like not even uh, one third of the documentary. <laughs> it's pretty slow, but we're trying. We are trying to get closer and closer every day. So. Baby, my heart could still fall as hard at 23. And I'm thinking about how people fall in love in mysterious ways. Maybe just the touch.
touch of a hand Well, me, I fall in love with you every single day And I just want to tell you I am So, honey, now There, there are different uh, program requirements and uh, different universities, but the important thing is to get the highest academic marks that you can, but at the same time to to complete a lot of um, other activities outside of the classroom, whether that's within the school and clubs uh, and build up this leadership experience, uh, teamwork skills, cooperative cooperative skills. Um, uh, this is this is an important part of development as a young person and showing the university what you have to offer so if you can um, build uh, a, a resume of experiences and put that along with the application it's not only necessary but it's also very helpful <laughs> Skill 
，我觉得更多的是透过日常生活中跟同学的相处，还有呃你个人的一些兴趣跟志向，然后自己去摸索，自己去调整。I think the extracurricular activities that students do are a great way for you to stand out from the other students who are just getting great, good grades or getting okay grades and going to school and not doing much else. I think um, doing meaningful extracurricular activities, whether again, like I said, it's for the community or it's something academic or something sports related or something in the performing arts, these. These things, these activities, or these um, uh, programs, can help you can help you tell your story and then really strengthen your application. So when the admissions officers looks at your application and says, "Wow, not only did you go to school and get good grades, or did you know you did these, you studied these subjects and so forth, but you also did these extracurricular activities, whether it's in China, whether it's in Europe, or in the U.S. or in somewhere else in the world." It's pretty meaningful, right? It's pretty powerful. Um, and on top of that, if you go do a program that offers credit, so if you did something that offered high school credit, uh, U.S. high school credit, or a U.S. university credit, which some of our World Strikes programs offer, um, it could be very powerful because not every program, a credit, what it really does is it shows, it proves that you can succeed in a Western education environment. When you identify, if you can show, you know, like I said, through your application, through your essays, through your letters of recommendation, or through your uh, through your interviews, or even just a visit to the schools, or in the projects that you do, if you're if you can show that you can you can analyze an issue, you can come up with solutions to that issue, and then you can also uh, and then you have a point of view about. How to solve? How to apply your solution? And then you can communicate that point of view to other people, uh, to your classmates, to your professors, or to your teachers, uh, or to people that in your community. I think that's very powerful because those are the skills that, in the professional world, companies want. You know, they want people. They want talented people who have who embody those skills. And in Chinese, I mean, as you know, when I sort of finishing the li, right, 解决问题 and then 有有观点，最重要是有观点，然后你有观点以后，怎么去表达给人家，有这个表达能力，这些技巧都是很非常重要的。So if you have those skills, and you can show it in several different ways, I think you will be a very attractive candidate for your university. So to attack English as a subject uh, head on and try to study that as much as possible and practice as much as possible is really important. Um, but I think outside of coursework, I think there there should be uh, more emphasis on teamwork, uh, uh, whether it be through sports or or different school projects or um, trips together. I think uh, learning how to work as a team is very important. Um, uh, and developing leadership skills within a team unit. A lot of the time that I wasn't spending reading uh, or studying, I was actually being told to get a job, um, you know, join a sport, join a band, uh, a marching band, whatever it was. Um, you know, uh, I think, and those skills that aren't necessarily graded or uh, written in a report, uh, it's still very important in terms of growing as a person. Because 
照片也是，我知道，但是他是多少 ？Hello, hi, we are here, uh, at the place of the public show, in the public show's place, and now we have to control the screen. You can see there is a screen, and we have to show our documentary trailer again and again this screen. So we are working on it right now.
before we play and we need to say our band the name like the disrespect masters. So that's the problem we have made and we will stop it. That's okay. We are the best. Hello everyone! And because of that, they think that they are powerful. So tonight, I welcome you to listen to Liao Yuan International High School's The Disrespectful Masters. <laughs>
feel very happy right now. So、uh, this is the last show we we perform together.、Uh, we perform the show not for the show. It has some special meaning, like、uh, it's、uh, a memory of our friendship. It shows、uh, a great and excellent friendship. So I we really. We really, we really cherish our、uh, the time we we had before. So、uh, Daniel and Johnson is going to、uh, the foreign country. We will miss them very much.、Uh, okay, Daniel. Daniel, I want to say、uh, when you when you leave. Liaoyuan, please、uh, take care of yourself.、Uh, don't touch. There's something not good for you, like uh, uh, less smoking and、uh, don't fight with other、uh, people in foreign country because、um, uh, you know the people in <laughs> foreign countries they all can beat you. So don't be very Jump. So then,、uh, do some、uh, exercise、uh, every day, please. So I hope、uh, when you come back, be a、uh, can be a very how you say very strong person, but not like that fat. So Johnson,、uh, maybe next year we will meet at CIC. Uh, you can、uh, we we can play together. So、uh, I hope you can study very well in the CIC, and I wish you have a happy life. I think、uh, in this performance、uh, we are very nervous. So. <laughs> We, we are. The performance is so crazy that we all maybe lose our, lost our、uh, the impressions like、uh, for other people. So、uh, maybe next time we have a performance, we can be more calm maybe. And.、Uh, Also, I cannot believe how good my voice sounds on this microphone. 而且我不敢相信，在这个麦克风里，他的声音会有多么的美美妙。嗯、呃，大家好，我是来自辽源国际部十年级二班的周瑞奥 Real， 然后我站在站在我后面这群人，他去年他们去年是跟我一个班的，然后后面在升十年级的时候，我们分开了，不过也就一个班的距离，一堵墙，但是我们里面有一个大 Daniel 大牛，一个大牛，还有一个 Johnson 张创在那里 ，Johnson。他们要比我们先一步，一个去加拿大，一个去美国。虽然不是见不到，但是这是今年我们有机会最后一次跳舞，所以，嗯，献献给大家，谢
Today is our last performance. Uh, I'm actually not uh, that nervous, but I feel a little bit sad. And uh, I, I, I don't know do I have a chance anymore uh, after I graduate from Liaoyuan. Uh, so I will do my best today.
this is really an unforgettable experience for me. Um, I think I learned a lot from it for my, for uh, reform my personality or the way that I, a sense of confidence like this. Um, it's very, it is very um, difficult for for me to uh, stand on the stage, face the face all the audience, and speak out. But uh, after a lot of after uh, several times that uh, I practiced, I thought it it is not that hard for me anymore. So I think um, practice makes perfect. I did speak in public several times. And actually, I did some mistake on it. I will, I will, I would feel embarrassed when I, when I, when I do, when I did mistake. But uh, actually, I think it's help. It is very helpful for me to grow up. Um, if people don't don't make any mistake, they won't grow up. And I think this mistake pushed me to um, to be an independent girl or confident girl because. Uh, if you if you stand on stage, you need to have a sense of confidence, and uh, and uh, tell you that you can do that. So I think after several experiences, I think um, I learned a lot, and uh, just like uh, I found a better me. We set up this band already for one year, so we have a lot of public show. Uh, Liao Yuan gave our, us many chances to do this performance. Um, I also uh, got a lot of experiments, and uh, uh, we learned the teamwork, how to do the teamwork. And I think we know, uh, we learn a lot to how to work with, with others. Uh, how to do well in a team, and uh, we have responsible uh, whatever what character we act, but we are important and we have responsible. Today is August 10th, we were in China very soon and uh, this semester I've been through a lot of fun things with my friends we joked around and had dinners together and also walked together uh, I really really want to pack them up with me but actually I can't uh, so now the only thing I, that I can do is remember them and remember them forever and uh, I want to thanks to those people who had support me and loved me and also gave me chances to show myself because that's really really helped me go a lot. Uh, now we will go to a better place. Uh, I will hold as much great memories as I can. And also, um, thanks for the past three years and thanks for that memories and good luck. Um, uh, since we are going to leave um, in one week, and, uh, it's about time to say goodbye. And to uh, all my friends uh, in Liaoyue or uh, in Shanghai, and um, it's really good to know you. Um, and, uh, and thanks for your part. Uh, we have been working on a documentary for the entire semester. I want to say to my friends, my honor to work with you, uh, and I want to say thank you to our teacher, uh, Doctor Yu. Uh, thanks you give me the chance to work with you. Today is the last day of our, in our school and first of all, it's time to say goodbye. Uh, uh, it's, it's been really nice to work with the, all the members who put effort in documentary. Uh, I hope uh, everyone can see our uh, documentary about international students and uh, also thanks you to and the Liao Yu International School to give me and uh, our students this opportunity. Liao Yu is a very good school. <laughs> and uh, I like the students in the Liao Yu. Um, I hope uh, in the future we will, we will still have, uh, we will still keep in touch. And uh, 
about the teacher. Uh, I think uh, the teachers in Liaoyang are all very nice.当下或许三年后五年后你会很痛苦或许你会觉得为什么我这么傻花了前面三到五年做了这件事情而没有去执行我原来我很希望做的那个构想那你有没有 no problem 这就是你的人生 人来到世上就是在做一些人生上的体验我觉得很重要就是你随时要保持一颗 open minded的心 然后你要充满你的好奇心不是太困难然后接下来如果买车我希望买房我希望结婚然后接下来如果买车我希望买什么车买房我希望买多大的房那如果你把这个作为你自己的一个奋斗的目标即便今天你就赚比较少的钱 I think most of them are, and I think part of it's. I think it's uh, one of the things that helps an international student enjoy uh, going to a foreign country is is being open-minded and also just kind of appreciating like different ways of thought. Uh, when I was in undergraduate school, I studied for a semester in Ireland. Uh, I went to the University College of Dublin for study abroad, they call it. And uh, I thought that first first couple weeks were tough. Uh, you know, you're in a different country, and yeah. and like just trying to figure things out takes time. But once you get it, yeah, like after a couple weeks, you figure out where the market is, and and what you know what bus number you take, and kind of how people act. You get used to it, and you start. To Your parents are telling you not to do it. And you, you kind of feel like uh, that's a part of who I was. And that's anyway. So the, the point is, is. Don't listen to people. Don't you know? If you want to become a writer, be a writer. If you want to be a musician, be a musician. If you want to be uh, the greatest stockbroker that's ever lived, try to do that. But um, know that there's going to be times in your life where you, you question your deci decision making, and you know it's okay. Like I think uh, four years in university, you're going to grow a lot. But ten years after that, you're still trying to figure out. Uh, questions in life and you're still trying to develop as a person so learning I think happens very quickly in university but after university the learning process and finding yourself really doesn't stop happening it's not like after four years like 
you get a degree and all of a sudden you know everything on earth like you, you're constantly trying to uh, find uh, answers about things and, and try to find who you are